So hello, it is I, Jenny. I am not playing a character, though I am pretty much a character. I'm a cartoon in real life. And I'm a joy to have. Okay, so who's ready for Captain Underpants? Chapter 1, George and Harold. Meet George Beard and Harold Hutchins. George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top. Harold is the one on the right with the t-shirt and the bad haircut. Remember that now. George and Harold were best friends. They had a lot in common. They lived right next door to each other, and they were both in the same fourth grade class at Jerome Horowitz Elementary School. George and Harold were usually responsible kids. Whenever anything bad happened, George and Harold were usually responsible. But don't get the wrong idea about these two. George and Harold were actually very nice boys. No matter what everybody else thought, they were good, sweet, and lovable. Well, okay, maybe they weren't so sweet and lovable, but they were good nonetheless. <laughs> there they are. Being good, but not so good. Okay. It's just that George and Harold each had a silly streak a mile long. Usually that silly streak was hard to control. Sometimes it got them into trouble. And once it got them into big, big trouble. Before, but before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. Okay, here they are. Trala lying up a hill. Uh, okay. Chapter 2. Treehouse Comics, Inc. After a hard day of cracking jokes, pulling pranks, and causing mayhem at school, George and Harold liked to rush to the old treehouse in George's backyard. Inside the treehouse were two big old fluffy chairs, a table, a cupboard crammed with junk food, and a padlocked crate filled with pencils, pens, and stacks and stacks of paper. Mm, cute little treehouse. Now, Harold loved to draw, and George loved to make up stories, and together, the two boys spent hours and hours writing and drawing their very own comic books. Over the years, they had created hundreds of their own comics, starring dozens of their own superheroes. First, there was Dog Man. Then came Timmy the Talking Toilet. And who could forget the amazing Cow Lady? But the all-time greatest superhero they ever made up had to be the amazing Captain Underpants. George came up with the idea. Most superheroes look like they're flying around in their underwear, he said. Well, this guy actually is flying around in his underwear. The two boys laughed and laughed. Yeah, said Harold. He could fight with wedgie power. George and Harold spent entire afternoons writing and drawing the comic adventures of Captain Underpants. He was the coolest superhero ever. That's them working on their comics really hard at work. Luckily for the boys, the secretary at Jerome Horowitz Elementary School was much too busy to keep an eye on the copy machine. So whenever they got a chance, Harold and George would sneak into the office and run off several hundred copies of their latest Captain Underpants adventure. After school, they sold their homemade comics on the playground for 50 cents each. Look at them being little entrepreneurs. Chapter 3, The Adventures of Captain Underpants. Now this is really neat because it looks like a comic book. So this is their comic, Captain Underpants. So here we go. The really cool adventures of Captain Underpants, written by George Beard, Okay, so there was a connectivity issue. Are you guys still there? I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, the program that I use booted me off, and I was like, rude? Very rude. It's really tough. Um, I'm probably going to have to like upgrade more equipment to make sure that the internet doesn't lag, but I have high-speed internet, uh, but this seems to happen quite often. A lot of my friends who are trying to do live streams are also having difficulties. I don't know if it's because uh, a lot more people are online now. That could be just a 
Silly hypothesis. I have no idea. Okay, I'm back. I want to make sure that I'm actually back on Facebook as well. I'm not seeing any comments coming back from Facebook. I'm only seeing my YouTube peoples. Okay, Facebook. Facebook is back. Okay, so we left off where I'm reading the comic. <laughs> yes, I totally broke the internet. <laughs> reading the comic that the kids created. So uh, right here, you see the... the uh, I, oh my gosh, this is so trippy. Um, the old man, superhero, and he's having a hard time fighting the uh, the robber, the bank robber. What a bad guy. So he's laughing. <laughs> then along came a new improved extra strength superhero. Tra-la-la. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's egg, egg salad sandwich. Uh, no way. I'm Captain Underpants. So here, you know, here's Captain... Oh, gosh. I would be a really bad meteorologist. Uh, Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants was faster than a speeding waistband, more powerful than boxer shorts, and able to leap tall buildings without getting a wedgie. Tra-la-la! Night and day, Captain Underpants watched over the city, fighting for truth, justice, and all that is pre-shrunk and cottony. Meanwhile, at a nearby elementary school... Turn the page... It was Stinky Taco Surprise Day at the cafeteria. Yuck! Everybody hated it so much. They went away. Soon, the cafeteria food came to life. I am the Incredible Hunk! The monster ran around the school eating everything in sight. This is the monster. He's eating everything in sight. Mom, 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 mom. Help! The inedible hunk just ate up 15 folding chairs and the gym teacher! Oh no! Not folding chairs! That was the principal, actually. I should have given him a different voice, maybe. Th this looks like a job for... Tra-la-la! Captain Underpants! Captain Underpants shot lots of underwear at the monster, but it didn't do any good. Zip, munch, he would just eat the, uh, briefs. He would eat the calzoncillos. Oh my goodness. So Captain Underpants took off running. The inedible hunk chased him. Grrr! Help! And chased him and chased him. Finally, the inedible hunk got too tired and thirsty to chase Captain Underpants. How about a nice drink of water? So right here, uh, he's trying to lure him into the boys' bathroom to drink some water. So the monster took a long drink drink from a shiny white bowl, gulp, gulp, when suddenly, flush, hooray for Captain Underpants! And so the inedible hunk got flushed away and was never heard from again. Tra-la-la! The end! Don't miss our next exciting adventure, Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toilets, coming soon to a playground near you. So this is really cute. This is basically the end of their little comic, right? So they put this at the end, at the very back of their comic book. And now on to chapter four. Mean old Mr. Krupp. Do you see that old guy looking out the window up there? That's Mr. Krupp, the principal. Let me see. There he is. Now, Mr. Krupp was the meanest sourest old principal in the whole history of Jerome Horowitz Elementary School. He hated laughter and singing. He hated the sounds of children playing at recess. In fact, he hated children altogether. And guess which two children Mr. Krupp hated most of all? <laughs> if you guessed George and Harold, you're right. Mr. Krupp hated George and Harold. He hated their pranks and their wise cracks. He hated their silly attitudes and their constant giggling. And he especially hated those awful Captain Underpants comic books. He's so angry. <sighs> I'm gonna get those boys one day, Mr. Krupp vowed. One day very, very soon. Chapter 5. One day very, very soon. Remember when I said that George and Harold's silly streak got them into big, a uh, big trouble once? Well, this is the story of how that happened, and how some huge pranks and a little blackmail turned their principal into the coolest superhero of all time. 
It was the day of the big football game between the Horowitz knuckleheads and the Steubenville stink bugs. Uh, the bleachers were filled with fans. The cheerleaders ran onto the field and shook their pom-poms over their heads. A fine black dust drifted out of their pom-poms and settled all around them. K! Give me a K! shouted the cheerleaders. K! repeated the fans. Give me an N! shouted the cheerleaders. N! repeated the fans. Give me an... Uh, 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 choo! sneezed the cheerleaders. Ah, 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 a choo! repeated the fans. The cheerleaders sneezed and sneezed and sneezed some more, and they couldn't stop sneezing. I would say it's a coriza. Hey! shouted a fan in the bleachers. Somebody sprinkled black pepper into the cheerleaders' pom-poms! I, I wonder who did that? asked another fan. So here's, like, the uh, sneeze debacle. The cheerleaders stumbled off the field, sneezing and dripping with mucus as the marching band members took their places. But when the band began to play, steady streams of bubbles began blowing out of their instruments. Bubbles were everywhere. Up and down the field, the marching band slipped and slid, leaving behind a thick trail of wet, bubbly foam. Hey! shouted a fan in the bleachers. Somebody poured bubble bath into the marching band's instruments! I wonder who did that? asked another fan. Soon the football teams took the field. The knuckleheads kicked the ball. Up, up, up went the ball. Higher and higher it went. The ball sailed into the clouds and kept right on going until nobody could see it anymore. Hey! shouted a fan in the bleachers. Somebody filled the game ball with helium! I wonder who did that? asked another fan. So here are the football players and the marching band, and they're all slipping and sliding. Ay, Dios. But the missing ball didn't make any difference because at that moment, the knuckleheads were rolling around the field, scratching and itching like crazy. Hey! shouted the coach. Somebody replaced our deep-heated mus muscle rub lo lotion with Mr. Prankster's extra scratchy itching cream. We wonder who did that, shouted the fans in the bleachers. The whole afternoon went on much the same way, with people shouting everything from... Hey, somebody put sea monkeys in the lemonade to, hey, somebody glued all the bathroom doors shut. Before long, most of the fans in the bleachers had gotten up and left. The big game had been forfeited, and everyone in the entire school was miserable. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. Yeah, miserable, miserable day. Miserable game. Everyone, that is. Except for two giggling boys crouching in the shadows beneath the bleachers. Those, those were our best pranks yet, laughed Harold. Yep, chuckled George. They'll be hard to top, that's for sure. I hope we don't, you know, get busted for this, said Harold. Don't worry, said George. We covered our tracks really well. There's no way we'll get busted. So here they are laughing away. Uh... In the bleachers, under the bleachers, rather. Chapter 6, Busted. The next day at school, an announcement came over the loudspeakers. George Beard and Harold Hutchins, please report to Principal Krupp's office at once. Uh-oh, said Harold. I don't like the sound of that. Don't worry, said George. They can't prove anything. George and Harold entered Principal Krupp's office and sat down on the chairs in front of his desk. The two boys had been in this office together countless times before, uh, but this time was different. Mr. Krupp was smiling. As long as George and Harold had known Mr. Krupp, they had never, ever seen him smile. Mr. Krupp knew something. Hm. I didn't see you boys at the big game yesterday, said Mr. Krupp. Uh, no, said George. We weren't feeling well, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Harold stammered nervously. Uh, we, we went home. Uh, oh, that's too bad, said Principal Krupp. You boys missed a good game. George and Harold quickly glanced at each other, gulped, and tried hard not to look guilty. Lucky for you, I have videotape of the whole thing, Mr. Krupp said. He turned on the television in the corner and pressed the play button on the VCR. 
Dun, dun, dun. A black and white image appeared on the TV screen. It was an overhead shot of George and Harold sprinkling, sprinkling pepper into the cheerleader's pom-poms. Next came a shot of George and Harold pouring liquid bubble bath into the marching band's instruments. Oh, how do you like the pregame show? asked Mr. Krupp with a devilish grin. George eyed the television screen in terror. He couldn't answer. Harold's eyes were glued to the floor. He couldn't look. The tape went on and on, revealing all of George and Harold's behind-the-scenes antics. By now, both boys were eyeing the floor, squirming nervously and dripping with sweat. Mr. Krupp turned off the TV. Whoops. You know, he said, ever since you boys came back to this school, it's been one prank after another. First, you put dissected frogs in the jello salad at the parent-teacher banquet. Then you made it snow in the cafeteria. Then you rigged all the intercoms so they played Weird Al Yankovic songs full blast for six hours straight. For four Long years you two have been running amuck in this school, and I've never been able to prove anything until now. Mr. Krupp held the videotape in his hand. Uh, I took the liberty of installing tiny video surveillance cameras all around the school. I knew I'd catch you two in the act one day. I just didn't know it would be so easy. Ha! Just laughing, amusing himself. Chapter 7, A Little Blackmail. Mr. Krupp sat back in his chair and chuckled to himself for a long, long time. Finally, George got up the courage to speak. What are you going to do with that tape? He said. I thought you'd never ask, laughed Principal Krupp. I've thought long and hard about what to do with this tape, Mr. Krupp said. At first, ugh, I thought I'd send copies to your parents. The boys swallowed hard and sank deeply into their chairs. Then I thought I might send a copy to the school board, Mr. Krupp continued. I can get you both expelled for this. The boys swallowed harder and sank deeper into their chairs. Finally, I came to a decision, Mr. Krupp concluded. I think the football team would be very curious to find out just who was responsible for yesterday's fiasco. I think I'll send a copy to them. George and Harold leaped out of their chairs and fell to their knees. No! cried George. You can't do that. They'll kill us! Yeah! begged Harold. They'll kill us and, and every day for the rest of our lives! Mr. Krupp laughed and laughed. Please have mercy, the boys cried. We'll do anything. Anything, asked Principal Krupp. With delight, he reached into his desk, pulled out a list of demands, and tossed it at the boys. If you don't want to be dead as long as you live, you'll follow these rules exactly. That's him giving out the, giving out the rules. George and Harold carefully looked over the list. This, this is blackmail, said George. Call it what you like, Principal Krupp snapped. But if you two don't follow the list exactly, then this tape becomes the property of the Horowitz knuckleheads. So as you can see right here, you got the list of um, rules, like no more practical jokes or pranks, no laughing or smiling. You know, no more Captain Underpants, wash my car, mow my... You can assume he's asking them to do a lot of uh, chores for, for him. Chapter 8, Crime and Punishment. At 6 o'clock the next morning, George and Harold dragged themselves out of bed, walked over to Mr. Krupp's house, and began washing his car. Then, while Harold scrubbed the tires, George roamed around the yard, pulling up all the weeds and crabgrass he could find. Afterward, they cleaned the gutters and washed all the windows on Mr. Krupp's house. Yay. At school, George and Harold sat up straight, listened carefully, and spoke only when spoken to. 
They didn't tell jokes. They didn't pull pranks. They didn't even smile. Their teacher kept pinching herself. I just know this is a dream, <laughs> she said. At lunch, the two boys vacuumed Mr. Crump's, op Mr. Crump's office, shined his shoes, and polished his desktop. At recess, they clipped his fingernails and ironed his tie. Each spare moment in the boys' daily schedule was spent catering to Mr. Krupp's every whim. Here we go. After school, George and Harold mowed Mr. Krupp's lawn, tended his garden, and began painting the front of his house. At sunset, Mr. Krupp came outside and handed each boy a stack of books. Gentlemen! He said, I've asked your teachers to give you both extra homework. Now go home, study hard, and I'll see you back here at six o'clock tomorrow morning. We've got a busy day ahead of us. Thank you, sir, moaned the two boys. George and Harold walked home dead tired. Man, this was the worst day of my entire life, said George. Don't worry, said Harold. We only have to do this for eight more years. Then we can move away to some far-off land and they'll never find us. Maybe Antarctica. I've got a better idea, said George. He took a piece of paper out of his pocket and handed it to Harold. It was an old magazine ad for the 3D Hypno Ring. How is this going to help us? asked Harold. All we gotta do is hypnotize Mr. Krupp, said George. We'll make him give us the video and forget this whole mess ever happened. That's a great idea, said Harold. And the best part is we only have to wait four to six extra weeks for delivery. So this is the ad. Ugh. I gotta get better at my book holding skills. The ad right here. Chapter nine, four to six weeks later. Ugh. Okay. After four to six weeks of backbreaking slave labor, grueling homework assignments, and humiliating good behavior at school, a package arrived in George's mailbox from the Lil Wise Guy Novelty Company. It was the 3D Hypno Ring! Hallelujah! cried George. It's everything I ever hoped for. Let me see, let me see, said Harold. Don't, don't look directly at it, warned George. You don't want to get hypnotized, do you? Do you really think it'll, it'll work? Asked Harold. Do you really think we can amaze our friends, control our enemies, and take over the world just like the ad says? It better work, said George, or else we just wasted four whole bucks. They're scheming. They're scheming. Chapter 10, The 3D Hypno Ring The next morning, George and Harold didn't arrive early at Mr. Krupp's house to wash his car and reshingle his roof. In fact, they were even a little late getting to school. When they finally showed up, Mr. Krupp was standing at the front door waiting for them, and boy, was he mad! Very angry, Mr. Krupp. Mr. Krupp escorted the boys into his office and slammed the door. All right, where were you two this morning? He growled. We wanted to come over to your house, said George, but we were busy trying to figure out the secret of this ring. What ring? snapped Mr. Krupp. George held, his, held up his hand and showed the ring to Principal Krupp. Uh... It's got one of those weird patterns on it, said Harold. If you stare at it long enough, a picture appears. Well, hold still, snarled Mr. Krupp. I can't see a darn thing. Uh, I have to move it back and forth, <laughs> said George, or else it won't work. Mr. Krupp's eyes followed the ring back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You have to stare deeper into the ring, said Harold. Deeper, 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 deeper. You are getting sleepy, said George. Very sleepy. Mr. Krupp's eyelids began to droop. 
I'm so sleepy. <sighs> he mumbled. After a few minutes, Mr. Krupp's eyes were closed tight and he began to snore. You are under our spell, said George. When I snap my fingers, you will obey our every command. Snap! I will obey, mumbled Mr. Krupp. All right, said George. Have you uh, still got that videotape of me and Harold? Yes, mumbled Mr. Krupp. Well, hand it over, bub, George instructed. Mr. Krupp unlocked a large file cabinet and opened the bottom drawer. He reached in and handed George the videotape. George stuffed it into his backpack. Harold took a different video out of his backpack and put it into the file cabinet. What's that video? asked George. It's one of my sister's old Boomer the Purple Dragon sing-along videos. <laughs> nice touch, said George. Chapter 11, Fun with Hypnosis. When Harold bent down to close the file cabinet, he took a quick look inside. Whoa! He cried, look at all the stuff in here. The file cabinet was filled with everything Mr. Krupp had taken away from the boys over the years. There were slingshots, whoopee cushions, skateboards, fake doggy doo-doo. You name it, it was there. Look at this, cried George. A big stack of Captain Underpants comics. He's got every issue, said Harold. So here they are dis discovering the stash. For hours, the boys sat on the floor, laughing and reading their comics. Finally, George looked up at the clock. Yikes, he said. It's almost lunchtime. We better clean up this mess and get to class. The boys looked up at their principal, who had been standing behind them in a trance all morning. Gee, I almost... Wrong voice. Gee, I almost forgot about Mr. Krupp, said Harold. Well, what should we do with him? Do you want to have some fun? asked George. Why not? said Harold. I haven't had any fun for the last four to six weeks. Cool, said George. He walked up to Mr. Krupp and snapped his fingers. Snap! You are... A chicken! he said. Suddenly, Mr. Krupp leaped onto his desk and flapped his arms. Cluck, 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 he cried, kicking his papers off the desk behind him and pecking at his pen and pencil set. George and Harold howled with laughter. Let me try, let me try, said Harold. Um, you are a monkey. <laughs> There's Mr. Krupp acting like a chicken. You gotta snap your fingers, said George. Oh, yeah, uh, said Harold. Uh, snap! You are a monkey! Suddenly, Mr. Krupp sprang off his desk and began swinging from the fluorescent light fixtures. Oh, 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 He shrieked, leaping from one side of the room to the other. George and Harold laughed so hard, they almost cried. My turn, my turn, said George. Let's see, what should we turn him into next? I know, Harold said, holding up a Captain Underpants comic. Let's turn him into Captain Underpants. Good idea, said George. Snap, you are now the greatest superhero of all time, the amazing Captain Underpants. Mr. Krupp tore down the red curtain from his office window and tied it around his neck. Then he took off his shoes, socks, shirt, pants, and his awful toupee. Tra-la-la, he sang. Mr. Krupp stood before them, looking quite triumphant, with his cape blowing in the breeze of the open window. George and Harold were dumbfounded. You know, said George, he kind of looks like Captain Underpants. Yeah, Harold replied. After a short silence, the two boys looked at each other and burst into laughter. George and Harold had never laughed so hard in their lives. Tears ran down their faces and they rolled about the floor, shrieking in hysterics. After a while, George pulled himself up from the floor for another look. Hey, George cried, where'd he go? Chapter 12, Out the Window. So this is what... Uh, Principal Krupp looks like as Captain Underpants. George and Harold dashed to the window and looked out. There, running across the parking lot, was a pudgy old guy in his underwear with a red cape flowing behind him. Kippin' 
Oh, Mr. Crop, come back, shouted Harold. He won't answer to that, said George. He thinks he's Captain Underpants now. Oh, no, said Harold. He's probably running off to fight crime, said George. Oh, no, said Harold. And we gotta stop him, said George. Oh, no, cried Harold. No way. Look, said George, he could get killed out there. Harold was unmoved. Or worse, said George, we, we could get into big trouble. You're right, said Harold. We gotta go after him. The two boys opened the bottom file cabinet drawer and took out their slingshots and skateboards. Do you think he, we should bring anything else? asked Harold. Yeah, said George. Let's, let's bring the fake doggy doo-doo. Good thinking, said Harold. You never know when fake doggy doo-doo is going to come in handy. <sighs> Harold stuffed Mr. Krupp's clothes, shoes, and toupee into his backpack. Then together the two boys leaped out the window, slid down the flagpole, and took off their skateboards took off on their skateboards after the amazing Captain Underpants. Whoa! <laughs> Chapter 13, Bank Robbers. George and Harold rode their skateboards all over town looking for Captain Underpants. I can't find him anywhere, said Harold. You'd think a guy like him would be easy to spot, said George. Then the boys turned a corner, and there he was. Captain Underpants was standing in front of a bank, looking quite heroic. Mr. Crop! cried Harold. Shh! said George. Don't call him that. Call him Captain Underpants. Oh, yeah, said Harold. And don't forget to snap your fingers, said George. Right, said Harold. But before he got a chance, the bank doors flew wide open and out stepped two robbers. The robbers took one look at Captain Underpants and stopped dead in their tracks. Surrender, said Captain Underpants, or I will have to resort to wedgie power. Oh no, whispered Harold and George. Mm. Nobody moved for about ten seconds. Finally, the robbers looked at each other and burst out laughing. They dropped their loot and fell up to the sidewalk, screaming in hysterics. Almost immediately, uh, the cops showed up and arrested the crooks. Let that be a lesson to you, cried Captain Underpants. Never underestimate the power of underwear. The police chief looked quite angry, marched over to Captain Underpants. And just who the heck are you supposed to be? The police chief demanded. Why, I'm Captain Underpants, the world's greatest superhero, said Captain Underpants. I fight for truth, justice, and all that is pre- okay, So we left off where the boys now knocked Captain Underpants off his feet as the cops were trying to handcuff him. So this is uh, what the escándalo looks like, okay? So we're now at chapter four, The Big Bang. After their quick escape, George, Harold, and Captain Underpants stopped on a deserted street corner to catch their breath. Okay, said George. Let's dehypnotize him quick before something else happens. Ah! Kaboom! There was a big explosion. A huge explosion came from the rare crystal shop across the street. Heavy smoke poured out of the building. Suddenly, two robots with one stolen crystal emerged from the smoke and jumped into an old van. Did I just see two robots get into a van? asked Harold. You know, said George, up until now, this story was almost believable. Well, believe it or not, said Harold, we're not getting involved. I repeat, we are not getting involved. Just then, Captain Underpants leaped from the street corner and dashed in front of the van. Stop in the name of underwear, he cried. Uh-oh, said George. I think we're involved. The two robots started up the van and swerved around Captain Underpants. Unfortunately, the van brushed up against his red cape and it got caught. With a mighty jerk, Captain Underpants flipped backward and the van pulled him along as it drove away. Whoopsie-daisy, it's getting crazier. Grab him! cried George. The two boys skateboarded with all their might toward the speeding van and grabbed Captain Underpants by the ankles. Help! 
they cried as the van pulled them through the city streets. Mommy, said a little boy sitting on a bench. I just saw two robots driving a van with a guy in his underwear hanging off the back by a red cape pulling two boys on skateboards behind him with his feet. How do you expect me to believe such a ridiculous story? asked his mother. Finally, the van came to a screeching halt in front of an old abandoned warehouse. Not sketchy at all. The sudden stop made Captain, Underpa Captain Underpants flip over the roof of the van and crash through the front door of the building. Well, 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 said a strange voice from inside the warehouse. It looks like I have a visitor. Chapter 15, Dr. Diaper. Dun, dun, dun. George and Harold hid behind the van until the coast was clear. Then they sneaked up to the hole in the door and peeked inside. Captain Underpants was all tied up. The two robots were standing guard and the little strange man wearing a diaper was laughing maniacally. <laughs> I am the evil Dr. Diaper. The strange little man told Captain Underpants, and you will be the first to witness my takeover of the world. <laughs> Dr. Diaper placed the stolen crystal into a large machine called the Lasermatic 2000. The machine started to light up and make loud noises. Heavy gears began shifting and spinning, and a laser beam from the crystal shot straight up through the hole in the roof. In exactly 20 minutes, this laser beam will blow up the moon and send huge chunks of it crashing down upon every major city in the world, <laughs> laughed Dr. Diaper. Then I will rise from the rubble and take over the planet. Only one thing can help us now, said George. What, said asked Harold. Rubber doggy doo-doo, said George. So, um, if you want to see what Dr. Diaper looks like, here he is. In his Dr. Diaper glory. Super evil, that Dr. Diaper. So here we go. Let's see what this doggy doo-doo does. Am I right? Harold took the fake doggy doo-doo and a slingshot from George's backpack and handed them to him. Be careful, said Harold. The fate of the entire planet is in your hands. With careful and precise aim, George shot the rubber doo-doo through the air and across the room. It landed with a plop right at the feet of Dr. Diaper. Yes, whispered George and Harold. Dr. Diaper looked down at the doo-doo between his feet and turned bright red. Oh, dear me, he cried. I'm dreadfully embarrassed. Please excuse me. He began to waddle toward the restroom. This has never happened to me before, I assure you, he said. I, I guess with all the excitement, I, I, I just... Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, no. Que pena. Que pena, Dr. Diaper. Okay. <laughs> just making sure I'm still on. Still on. While Dr. Diaper was off changing himself, George and Harold sneaked into the old warehouse. Immediately, the robots detected the boys and began marching toward them. Destroy the intruders, said the robots. Destroy the intruders. George and Harold screamed and ran to the back of the warehouse. Luckily, George found two old boards and gave one of them to Harold. We're not going to have to resort to extremely graphic violence, are we? asked Harold. I sure hope not, said George. Chapter 16, the extremely graphic violence chapter. Warning, the following chapter contains graphic scenes showing two boys beating the tar out of a couple of robots. If you have high blood pressure or if you faint at the sight of motor oil, we strongly urge you to take better care of yourself and stop being such a baby. <laughs> Introducing flip o -rama. So this is an interesting part in the book right here. Everybody, as everybody knows, nothing enhances silly action sequences more than really cheesy animation. And so, for the first time in history of great literature, we proudly bring you the latest in cheesy animation technology, the art of Fliporama. Here's how it works. Step one, place your left hand inside the dotted lines marked left hand here. Hold the book open flat. 
Okay. Step two, grasp, grasp the right hand page with your right thumb and index finger. Inside the dotted lines marked here, right thumb here. Step three, now quickly flip the right hand page back and forth until the picture appears to be animated. Okay, so this is a, this part is a little difficult to uh, showcase uh, because you're supposed to do it in person and it's kind of like a like a flip through adventure. It's like a, a little animated sequence here. But essentially, George and Harold are fighting off these evil robots, okay? So there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of uh, graphic violence. Yeah. Ah! Me and my terrible sound effects. Um, George, sa right here, George saves Harold by, uh, you know, giving this robot uh, an extreme cocotazo. And then over here, Harold returns the favor because he's a good friend. He's about to smack the living daylights out of this robot, which he does right here. And, uh... Oh, I need flipping the pages. Okay, and then mix nuts and bolts. This is the carnage left behind from all the robots. Um, <laughs> and uh, now they're really happy and they're like jumping up and down on these robot parts. It's, it's a little, it's a little gory. Um, and uh, now there's all this smoke. You know, so there's, there's a huge battle that just happened. Um. And now we're we're now at uh, chapter seventeen, the escape. Hopefully, we can get through the end of this book without this thing crashing again. Light all the candles. Okay. After defeating the robots, George and Harold untied Captain Underpants. Come on! cried Harold. Let's get you out of here. Wait, said Captain Underpants. We have to save the world first. So George, Harold, and Captain Underpants frantically looked all over the Lasermatic 2000, searching for a way to shut it down and stop the inevitable disaster. It's gonna be a disaster. Um, said Harold, I think this might be the lever we want. He pulled the self-destruct lever with all his might. Suddenly, the Lasermatic 2000 began to sputter and shake. The huge laser beam turned off and pieces of the machine began flying off in all directions. It's gonna blow! cried Harold. Run for your lives! Not so fast! screamed Dr. Diaper, who had appeared out of nowhere. You demolished my robots, you destroyed my Lasermatic 2000, and you ruined my one chance to take over the world! But you won't live to tell the tale. Dr. Diaper pulled out his Diapermatic 2000 ray gun and pointed it at George, Harold, and Captain Underpants. Oh, no! <laughs> Captain Underpants quickly stretched a pair of underwear and shot it at Dr. Diaper. The underwear landed right on the evil doctor's head. Help! cried Dr. Diaper. I can't see! I can't see! There he is. He, he can't. He can't see. He can't see. George and Harold ran out of the warehouse as fast as they could. Great shot, Captain Underpants, cried Harold. There's just one thing I don't understand, said George. Where'd you get the extra pair of underwear? What extra pair, said Captain Underpants. Uh, never mind that, cried George. Let's just get out of here before the Lasermatic 2000 thing ex- Explodes! There was obviously an explosion. The Lasermatic 2000 blew up, tearing apart the old warehouse. It sent flaming shards of red-hot metal in every direction. Fire fell from the skies around, around our heroes, and the earth began to crumble beneath their feet. Oh no! cried Harold. We're doomed! Chapter 18, to make a long story short. They got away. <laughs> Chapter 19, Back to School. George, Harold, and Captain Underpants made a quick stop outside the police station. They tied Dr. Diaper to a lamp post and attached a note to him. There, said Captain Underpants. That ought to explain everything. They, they left poor Dr. Diaper on a pole with underwear over his head and... Smork it, Banna moments. Hmm. 
Then George and Harold led Captain Underpants back to Jerome Horowitz Elementary School. Why are we going here? asked Captain Underpants. Well, said George, you have to do some undercover work here. Yeah, said Harold, reaching into his backpack. Uh, put these clothes on and make it snappy. Uh, don't forget your hair, said George. Captain Underpants quickly got dressed behind some bushes. Well, how do I look? he asked. Pretty good, said George. Now, now try to look really mad. Captain Underpants made the nastiest face he could. You know, said Harold, he kind of looks like Mr. Krupp. Harold, whispered George, he is Mr. Krupp. Oh, yeah, said Harold. I almost forgot. So there's Captain Underpants looking like, whoop, oh, can you see? Looking like who he really is, which is Mr. Krupp. Before long, they were all back inside Mr. Krupp's office. Okay, Captain Underpants, said George. You are now Mr. Krupp. Snap your fingers, whispered Harold. Oh, yeah, said George. Snap, you are now Mr. Krupp. Uh, who's Mr. Krupp? asked Captain Underpants. Oh, no, cried Harold. It's not working. The boys tried again and again to dehypnotize Captain Underpants, but nothing seemed to work. Hmm, said Harold. Let me see the instruction manual for that ring. George checked his pants pockets. Um, said George. I think I lost it. You what? cried Harold. The two boys searched frantically through the office, but the 3D hypno ring instruction manual was nowhere to be found. Never mind, said George. I, I have an idea. He removed the flowers from a large vase in the corner. Then he poured out all of the water over Captain Underpants' head. Well, well, what did you do that for? cried Harold. I saw them do it in a cartoon once, said George, so it's got to work. After a few minutes, Mr. Krupp slowly came to. Uh, what's going on here? he demanded. Why, why am I all wet? George and Harold had never been so glad to see Mr. Krupp in all their, the, all their lives. <laughs> I'm so happy I could cry, said Harold. Well, you're gonna cry when I give you that video, when I give that videotape to the football team, shouted Mr. Krupp. I have had it with you two. Principal Krupp took the videotape out of his file cabinet. You boys are dead meat, he sneered. He stormed out of his office with the video and headed toward the gym. George and Harold smiled. Wait till the football team sees that video, said Harold. Yeah, said George. I sure hope they like singing Purple Dragons. Hey, look, said George. I found the 3D Hypno Ring instruction manual. It was in my shirt pocket, not my pants pocket. Well, throw it away. Throw that thing away, said Harold. We'll never see it again. I sure hope not, said George. Chapter 20, The End? Here are all the, the football players and they're singing. Um, la 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 la, we love Boomer, la 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 la. <laughs> Things at Jerome Horowitz Elementary School were never quite the same after that fateful day. The football team enjoyed Mr. Krupp's video so much that they changed their name from the Knuckleheads to the Purple Dragon Sing-Along Friends. The name change the name change didn't go over too well with the fans, but hey, who was going to argue with a bunch of linebackers, huh? George and Harold went back to their old ways, pulling pranks, cracking jokes, and making new comic books. They had to keep an eye on Mr. Krupp, though, because for some strange reason, every time he heard the sound of finger snapping, snap, Principal Krupp turned back into. <laughs> You know who. Oh no, cried Harold. Here we go again, said George. Tra la la. And that is the end of our story. It only took a million attempts to finish it. Yay!